guys, today I have a book haul to share with you. So as I usually do with my book hauls, I have 20 books to share with you guys. So let's get going so we're not sitting here for too terribly long. Some of these I have read, so I won't really spend too much time on them. But yeah, for the most part, I'm just going to kind of be giving you my just the synopsis for, for these books and uh, maybe yeah why I'm excited for some of them um but yeah let's get going first up Tsarina by Ellen Alpstein before there was Catherine the Great there was Catherine Alexevinia let me tell you guys when it comes to uh pronouncing Russian names I've always learned just try to mumble your way out with it as quickly as possible and maybe people think you know what you're talking about no that's how I've tried to do it anyway so yeah let me try that again before there was Catherine the Great there was Catherine Alexevinia <laughs> the first woman to, to rule Russia in her own right um, so yeah, we're taking place in St. Petersburg in 1725. Peter the Great lies dying in his magnificent winter palace. The weakness and treachery of his only son has driven his father to an appalling act of cruelty and left the empire without an heir. Russia risks falling into chaos. Into the void steps the woman who has been by his side for decades, his second wife, Catherine Alexevinia, <laughs> as ambitious, ruthless, and passionate as Peter himself. Born into devastating poverty, Catherine used her extraordinary beauty and shrewd intelligence to ingratiate herself with Peter's powerful gener generals, finally seducing the Tsar himself. But even amid the splendor and opulence of her new life, the lavish feasts, glittering jewels, and candlelit hours in Peter's bedchamber, she knows the peril of her position. Peter's attentions are fickle and his rage is powerful. His, fir his first wife is condemned to a prison cell, her lover impaled alive in the Red Square. And now Catherine faces the ultimate test. Can she keep the Tsar's death a secret as she plays a lethal game to destroy her enemies and take the crown for herself. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of us, we're very familiar with Catherine the Grey. There's always been numerous, you know, movies and television series about Catherine the Great. So yeah, this is about another Catherine the Great. Or not the Great, but another Catherine, I should say. Another Catherine before Catherine the Great. Um, yeah, and I don't know anything about this woman, so I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited to learn about this woman and, you know, see this uh, side of Russian history and whatnot. Because I've said this before, I'm very, very familiar with, like, the Romanovs, you know, right there, you know, early 1900s up to 1918 when the Romanovs uh, get out of power and whatnot. Um, yeah, I'm very, very familiar with that, so I love learning a lot more Russian history, you know, going back you know, decades and decades before that, obviously, and centuries and whatever. So yeah, definitely cannot wait to get to this. Next up, I have this little Oregon Trail book, uh, essentially like a choose-your-own-adventure, choose-your-own-path sort of book. And this is something that me and my sister actually did, um, God, when did we upload this video? Did we upload this video back in maybe early April? I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, uh, we uploaded a video, me and my sister, we went through this book and we played it and yeah, we chose our path, you know, to see how far we can get into the book and try to make it to the end and whatnot. So yeah, that's all this book is. It's it's based off of the Oregon Trail video game, you know, the really pixelated video game and, you know, you gotta avoid getting bit by snakes and avoid dysentery and avoid, you know, just getting yourself injured or killed or poisoned or whatever. Um, so yeah, the game, if you like the little video game, and this book might be kind of right up your alley and whatnot. Like I said, it's like a choose your own adventure sort of game. And yeah, me and my sister, like I said, we, we uploaded a video of us playing this, and we had a lot of fun with it. It's just short and quick and easy. <laughs> Next up, The Arctic Fury by Greer McAllister. Eccentric Lady Jane Franklin makes an outlandish offer to adventurer Virginia Reeve. Take a dozen women, trek into the Arctic, and find her husband, Lord Franklin, and his lost exped expedition. Four parties have failed to find him, and Lady Franklin wants a radical new approach. Put the women in charge. Lady Franklin will disavow all knowledge of the expedition as it fails, but if it succeeds, she promises great rewards. A year later, Virginia stands trial for murder. Survivors of the expedition willing to publicly support her sit in the front row. There are only five left. What happened out there on the ice? Mm. Um, so, yeah. Um, this sounds really cool. I, my, I'm not quite sure if I'm just assuming some stuff about this book. Because I primarily picked this book up because... 
it's it's following Lady Franklin. She's trying to go after her husband, um, Lord Franklin. Um, is like is this like the same Franklin? Um, the the ship the ship the terror that disappeared. They were out kind of looking for like a north a north passage, you know, trying to cut around um, through you know the oceans and whatnot, like an Arctic passage, you know. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to get the details correct here, you guys. Um, that's kind of what I thought this book was sort of about, like the wife of Lord Franklin, because he the, his ship was. He took two ships out there, the the Terror and the Erebus, and the ships disappeared. Um, no one was able to find them for the longest time, and yeah, everybody on the on, on those two ships like mysteriously vanished and died and whatnot. No one really knows what happened. Um, there's a great TV series called The Terror that AMC put out um, that was very very good. So that's I, I don't know if I'm I'm in, I'm mistaken and kind of assuming that that this is following that that man that that Lord Franklin, his wife, uh, she's trying to search for her husband and the lost and the lost expedition and whatnot. Um, but like it's taken some liberties because I don't know if she really set out with her own crew of women because uh, it seems like there's like also a murder investigation going on in this book too. Am I making any sort of sense? I'm, I'm trying to be as clear as I can you guys but yeah I, I don't know if I, I'm kind of getting a wrong opinion about this book and what it supposedly is, or this just comes completely something else that I'm not really aware of. Uh, but either way, it sounds really awesome, even if I'm mistaken about what it's really about. Next up, Bridgerton, The Duke and I by uh, Julia Quinn, right? Julia Quinn? Yes, yes. I have finally got on board the, the Bridgerton train, you guys. I watched the first season of Bridgerton. I freaking love it. It was really good. I'm excited for the next uh, season and whatnot. Um, so yeah, Bridgerton. If you don't know what Bridgerton is about, if you're not aware of all the craziness going on, uh, in the ballrooms and drawing rooms of Regency London, rules abound. Uh, from their earliest days, children of aristocrats learn how to address an earl and curtsy before a prince, while others, dic uh, while while other dictates of the ton are unspoken yet universally understood. A proper duke should be imperious and, and aloof. A young marriageable lady should be amiable, but not too amiable. Uh, Daphne Bridgerton has always failed at the latter. The fourth of eight siblings in her close-knit family, she has formed friendships with the most eligible young men in London. Everyone likes Daphne for her kindness and wit, but no one truly desires her. She is simply too uh, deuced honest for that, too unwilling to play the romantic games that captivate gentlemen. Amiability is not a characteristic shared by Simon Bassett, Duke of Hastings. Recently returned to England from abroad, he attempts to shun both marriage and society, just as his callous father shunned Simon throughout his painful childhood. Yet an encounter with his best friend's sister offers another option. If Daphne agrees to a fake courtship, Simon can deter the mamas who parade their daughters before him. Daphne, meanwhile, will see the prospects and her reputation soar. So, yeah. Kind of like your standard, your standard Regency era sort of romance, this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it sounds really awesome. I, I like I said, I really love the the first season. I'm curious how this book is. If I'll enjoy this book as much as I did the show. So yeah, definitely can't wait to get to this. And yeah, hopefully continue with the rest of the series in the future. Next up, the house in the Ceru Cerulean Sea. I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, by T. J. Clune. So, Linus Baker is a by-the-book caseworker in the department in charge of mag magical youth. At 40, he lives in a tiny house with a devious cat and his old, old records for company. But his quiet life is about to change. Linus is summoned by extremely upper management and given a curious and highly classified assignment. Travel to an orphanage on a distant island and determine whether six dangerous magical children are so dangerous, in fact, that they're likely to bring about the end of days. When Linus arrives at that strangest of islands, he's greeted by a series of mysterious figures, the greatest mystery of which is Arthur Parnassus, the master of the orphanage. As, as Linus and Arthur grow closer, Linus discovers the master would do anything to keep the children safe, even, in me even, even if it means the world has to burn, or worse, his secret comes to life. Yeah, I thought this was pretty cool. Uh, this was like, 
Barnes and Noble had this uh, like this was their their book of the month whenever that was I think it was a couple months ago uh, so yeah I was kind of the, the, this piqued my interest piqued my interest that Barnes and Noble was highlighting and yeah, it sounds like the sort of thing I'll like you know kind of a fantasy sort of thing Pretty as a Picture by Elizabeth Little. Marissa Dahl, a shy but successful film editor, travels to a small island off the coast of Delaware to work with the legendary and legendarily demanding director Tony Reese on a feature film with a familiar logline, Some Girls Die. Um, or sorry, Some Girl Dies, that's the logline, Some Girl Dies. So then, it's not much to go on, but the specifics don't concern Marissa. She'll spend her days in the editing room doing what she does best, turning pictures into stories. But she soon discovers that on this set, nothing is as it's supposed to be, or as it seems. Drawn into the investigation of the uns unsolved real-life murder that the movie takes as its central subject, Marissa soon realizes that the killer may still be on the loose, and he might not be finished. Ooh, sounds awesome. Uh, I just like this. Has, you know, has to do with like Hollywood and film and whatnot. So it has kind of sounded like a different sort of mystery thriller that really sparked my interest. Next up, A Castaway in Cornwall by Julie Clausen? Clayson? <laughs> Something like that. I saw the, in the title, Cornwall, and I immediately was like, oh, like, like Poldark, because the Poldark series by Winston Graham and the TV show um, take place in, in Cornwall, England, and uh, I'm obsessed with Poldark, so yeah, I saw Cornwall in here and I was like, oh, maybe this will kind of be like Poldark. <laughs> I'm, I'm a weirdo, you guys. But yeah, what is this book about? Uh, set adrift on the tides of fate by the deaths of her parents and left wanting answers, Laura Calloway now lives with her uncle and his disapproving wife in North Cornwall. There she feels like a castaway, always viewed as an outsider, even as she yearns to belong. While wreckers search for valuables along the windswept, Corn windswept Cornwall coast, known for its many shipwrecks but few survivors, Laura searches for clues to the lives lost so she can write letters to next of kin and return keepsakes to rightful owners. When a man is washed ashore after a wreck, Laura acts quickly to protect him from a local smuggler determined to destroy him. That already sounds like Poldark right there, because there's, there's, seriously, there's, there's one book in Poldark that almost sounds very, very familiar, like halfway through the series. <laughs> um, I think that, I think that book's even called The Stranger from the Sea. Uh, so yeah, as Laura and a neighbor care for the survivor, they discover uh, he has curious wounds, and although he speaks in careful, educated English, his accent seems odd. Other clues wash ashore, and Laura soon realizes he is not who he seems to be. Despite the evidence against him, the mysterious man might provide her only chance to discover the truth about her parents' fates. Now it sounds like Frozen about like Anna and Elsa, how their parents died, you guys. Uh, with, froze, with, with Frozen, with danger pursuing them from every side and an unexpected attraction growing between them, will Laura ever find the answers she seeks? And this sounds, this, seriously, this sounds really cool, you guys. Historical fiction and Cornwall sign me up. Next up, I have this really cool book. This is H.R.H. Uh, so Many Thoughts on Royal Style by, who is it from again? Eliz Elizabeth Holmes. And yeah, when I was showing that cover there, you have Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle and the Queen Elizabeth and Princess Diana there on the cover. And this is just a little hardback book here. Um, just like like the, like it's suggesting focusing on royal style from the women of of uh, the Windsor family, yeah. And there's just pictures in here and some articles and writing and whatnot. Um, yeah, I definitely can't wait to get to this. I do love all things uh, the Windsor dynasty, you guys, the current monarchy and whatnot. So yeah, this should be pretty cool. Uh, something to kind of just randomly sit and pick up when I'm I'm bored, you know. <laughs> Next up, The Midnight Library by Matt Haig. I've heard so many people talking about this book and I've seen so many reviews for it that I finally caved and got this book because I was like, okay, now I'm really curious what this thing is about because it seems like a lot of people really, really love this book. Between life and death, there is a library. Up until now, Nora Seed's life has been full of misery and regret. She feels she has let everyone down, including herself, but things are about to change. When she finds herself in the Midnight Library, she has a chance to make things right. 
The books in the Midnight Library enable Nora to live as if she had done things differently. Each one contains a different life, a possible world in which she made different choices that played out in an infinite number of ways, affecting everyone she knew as well as many people she never met. With the help of an old friend, she can now undo every decision she regrets as she tries to work out her perfect life. But things aren't uh, always what she imagined they'd be, and soon her choices place the library and herself in extreme danger. Ooh, I think that's, that, that sounds pretty cool. I'm really curious. I mean, the, the synopsis is kind of really vague about that, you know, because it's I still have questions, you know, like, okay, well, what exactly is this Midnight Library, you know? So, yeah, that'd be kind of the point of the, uh, the world building, you know, the further you get into the book and whatnot. So, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And plus, yeah, I guess if it has something to do with books and libraries, great. <laughs> Next up, The Mystery of Mrs. Christie by Marie Benedict. And this is a book that I have already read and uh, reviewed, and I really, really enjoyed this. So yeah, I'll just give you a quick synopsis here. Uh, in December 1926, Agatha Christie got, goes missing. Investigators find her empty car on the edge of a deep, gloomy lake. The only clues is some tire tracks nearby and a fur coat left in the car. Strange for a frigid night. Her husband and daughter have no knowledge of her whereabouts, and England unleashes an unprecedented manhunt to find the up-and-coming mystery author. Eleven days later, she reappears, just as mysteriously as she disappeared, claiming amnesia and providing no explanations for her time away. And yeah, this is based off a, of a real-life incident that happened to uh, mystery writer Agatha Christie. Uh, she disappeared for eleven days. No one knows what happened. She never spoke about it at all. It's it's To this day, it's been bizarre. Uh, and yeah, this is Marie Bendict, you know, trying to fill in those answers, you know, her best idea and best theories and whatnot. Um, and yeah, I really love this book, you guys. Next up, The Umbrella Lady by V.C. Andrews. And this is actually a book that I won through a Goodreads a giveaway, so thank you, Goodreads. Uh, this, let's see, Saffron Faith Anders is certain her father will, will return shortly. Hours later, left on the train platform of some small village, the eight-year-old is clinging to her suitcase like a life raft. When the peculiar old woman approaches, Saffron is cautious, but exhaustion moves her to agree to rest at the woman's house while awaiting her father. Confined to the strange house, Saffron will undergo months and then years of transformation at the hands of the Umbrella Lady. Saffron's hair is cut to the nub, the clothes in her suitcase are burned, and no visitors are allowed. When letters arrive from Saffron's father, saying he has started a new family and will send for her shortly, hope returns to her heart. Uh, still, as all children in the world of V.C. Andrews learn, those who claim to care for you the most will often hurt you the worst. Yeah, I have never read a V.C. Andrews book, you guys. And yeah, I know this is not written specifically by V.C. Andrews because uh, she has a ghostwriter now because she did die. God, when did she die? She died quite a long time ago, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, there's been a ghostwriter using her name and whatnot, keeping her name alive and whatnot. So yeah, this is not actually written by her, but a ghostwriter. Um, so yeah, I've never read a V.C. Andrews. So I, I won this on Goodreads, like I said, because it sounded pretty cool, so I can't wait to see what it's like. Next up, The Historians by uh, Cecilia Ickbock, Ick <laughs> if I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is another book that I won through a Goodreads giveaway. Uh, this one, it is 1943, and Sweden's neutrality in the war is under pressure. Uh, Laura Dahlgren, the bright young right hand of the chief negotiator to Germany, is privy to these tensions, even as she tries to keep her head down in the mounting fray. However, when Laura's best friend from university, Britta, uh, is discovered murdered in cold blood, Laura becomes determined to find the killer. Prior to her death, Britta sent a report on racial profiling in Scandinavia to the secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in the middle of negotiation, negotiating a delicate alliance between Sweden and the Nazis, um, the, the foreign affairs man, he doesn't understand what Britta's work has to do with him. Um, when the pursuit of Britta's murderer leads Laura to his door, the two join forces to uncover the truth about what happened to Britta. Uh, but as Jens, uh, like I said, he's the foreign affairs minister, um, 
when him and Laura attempt to untangle the mysterious circumstances uh, surrounding Britta's death, they only become more mired in a web of lies and deceits. The trail to the truth will lead to a conspiracy that will topple, the, topple their nation's identity. A conspiracy some in Sweden will try to keep hidden at any cost. Ooh, yeah, awesome. I, I don't think I've really read anything taking place in Sweden during World War II, so that should be pretty awesome, you guys. I'm looking forward to this. Next up, The Perfect Guest by Emma Rue. We have two different points of view here. We have a 1988 timeline and a 2019 timeline. So yes, starting with uh, 1988, uh, Beth Soames is 14 years old when her aunt takes her to stay at Raven Hall, a rambling manor in the isolated East Anglian Fens. Uh, the Av the Averells, the family who lives there, are warm and welcoming, and Beth becomes fast friends with their daughter, Nina. At times, Beth even feels like she's truly part of the family until they ask her to help them with a harmless game, and nothing is ever the same. So then we skip forward to 2019. Uh, Sadie Langton is an actress struggling to make ends meet when she lands a well-paying gig pretending to be a guest at a weekend party. She is sent a suitcase of clothing, uh, uh, an out, um, a dozier outlining the role she is to play, and instructions. It's strange, but she needs the money, and when she sees the stunning manor she'll be staying at, she figures she's got nothing to lose. In person, Raven Hall is even grander than she'd imagine, even with damage from a fire decades before. Hmm. But the walls seem to have eyes. Uh, as day turns to night, Sadie starts to feel that there's something off about the glamorous guests who arrive. And as the party begins, it becomes chillingly apparent that the unseen host is playing games with everyone, including her. Uh, an unseen host, you say? That sounds almost like, and then there were none, if, if you know kind of how, and then there were none starts off. Because there's no host. <laughs> uh, see, this sounds pretty cool. You guys, I definitely can't wait to get to this. And I have read Emma Rue in the past, and I, I liked her first book, so I'm, I'm hoping I'll really like this one as well. Next up, Lana's War by Anita Abrell. Paris, 1943. Uh, Lana, uh, she is grieving the death of her husband, a music teacher killed at the hands of an SS officer. Uh, she finds purpose again when she's approached to join the resistance on the French Riviera. As the daughter of a Russian countess, Lana has the perfect background to infiltrate the immigrant society of Russian aristocrats who socialize with German officers, including the man who killed her husband. Ooh. Lana's cover story makes her the mistress of Guy Pascal, uh, a wealthy Swiss industrialist and fellow resistance member in whose villa uh, she lives. Together, they gather information on upcoming raids and help members of the Jewish community escape. Consumed by her work, she doesn't expect to become attached to a young Jewish girl or wonder about the secrets held by the man whose house she shares. As the Nazis' efforts intensify, her desire to protect the people she cares about puts them at risk, forcing her to make uh, to make an impossible choice. Ooh, sounds awesome. You guys, I definitely can't wait to get to this. I, I think I'm saying that all of these books because I mean it. <laughs> Next up, The Heiress by Molly Greeley. And this is uh, taking place in the world of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Um, so yeah, as a fussy baby, Anne de Burr was prescribed laudamon by her doctors to quiet her, and now the young woman must take the opium heavy syrup every day. Growing up confined to her father's mansion, Anne had few companions except her cousins, including Fitzwilliam Darcy, whom she is meant to marry, but Darcy does not love Anne or want her. When her father dies unexpectedly, leaving her his vast fortune, Anne has a shocking moment of clarity. What if her life of fragility and illness isn't truly real? What if she could free herself from the medicine that she's been told, told she can't live without? In a frenzy of desperation, Anne discards her laudanum and flees to her cousin in London, Colonel Fitzwilliam, who helps her through her painful recovery. Gone are her, who, gone are her hallucinations and lethargy, now replaced by a keen and suddenly awareness of her own inexperience in the ways of the world. Anne must forge a new identity for herself, learning to navigate high society and the heartbreak of forbidden love. The once wan, passive Anne gives way to a braver, more confident woman, leading to a powerful reckoning with the domineering mother determined to control Anne's fortune and her life. Uh, I am all about a good Pride and Prejudice retelling, you know, taking place in that world at least, so yeah, I'm very curious how this book is going to go, because sometimes Pride and Prejudice retellings can be rather hit or miss, so I guess we'll see how this goes. Next up, The Liar's Dictionary by, is that e Ellie, Ellie Williams? Eli Williams? Something like that? And it has a really cool cover, by the way. In the final year of the 19th century, Peter Winsworth is toiling away at the letter S for Swan B's multi-volume encyc Encyclopedic Dictionary. 
increasingly uneasy that his colleagues are attempting to corral uh, language and regiment facts, um, Wentzworth feels compelled to assert some sense of individual purpose and artist artistic freedom and begins inserting unauthorized fictitious entries into the dictionary. Uh -oh, how's, that, how's that going to go? In the present day, Mallory, a young intern employed by the publisher, must uncover these um, these Mount Weasels, <laughs> um, which up here, up here, there it says it gives you a definition for Mount Weasel. It says Mount Weasel is a noun, the phenomenon of false entries within dictionaries and works of reference, often used as a safeguard against copyright infringement. Okay, is that a real thing? I guess that's a real thing. Maybe I have to look that up. Um, but yeah, in the present day, like I said, this young woman named Mallory, she is meant to uncover these Mount Weasels before the work is digitized for modern readers. Uh, through the words and their definitions, she begins to sense their creator's motivations, hopes, and desires. Uh, more pressingly, she, has, she also has to contend with threatening phone calls from an anonymous caller. Is the change in the definition of marriage uh, really that controversial? And does the caller truly intend for the Swansby staff to burn in hell? As these two narratives combine, Winsworth and Mallory separated by 100 years, must discover how to negotiate the complexities of the often untrustworthy, hoax-strewn, and undefinable paths we call life. An exhilarating and laugh-out-loud debut, The Liar's Dictionary, celebrates the, the rigidity, fragility, absurdity, and joy of language while peering into questions of identity and finding, one, finding one's place in the world. That sounds awesome, you guys. This was also something that Barnes & Noble was kind of highlighting one specific month, and I was like, oh, this sounds cool. It has a really cool cool dictionary with this peacock with, like, in, in the, the feathers are, like, pages of the book. I love that. <laughs> and next up are Darkest Night by Jennifer Robeson. It is the autumn of 1943, and life is becoming increasingly perilous for Italian Jews, uh, like the Muzzin family, with Nazi Germany now occupying most of her beloved homeland, and the threat of imprisonment and, de and deportation grown ever more certain. Antonia Mazin has but one hope to survive. She must leave Venice and her parents and hide in the countryside with a man she has only just met. Uh, Nicole, Nicolo Girardi uh, was studying for the priesthood until a wartime tragedy forced him to leave the seminary to run his family's farm. A moral and just man, he refuses to remain a bystander to Nazi atrocities. Rather than follow Nita to risk a perilous escape across the mountains, he offers her shelter. To keep her safe and protect secrets of his own, however, Nico and Nina must convince everyone, his, even his own family, that they are married and in love. But farm life is not easy for a cultured girl who dreams of becoming a doctor like her father, and Nico's provincial neighbors are wary of the stranger in their midst. Even worse, they their distrust is shared by a local Nazi officer uh, with a vendetta against Nico. Uh, the more Carl Zwerger learns of Nina, the more his suspicions grow, and with them his determination to exact revenge. As Nina and Nico come to know know each other, their feelings deepen, transforming their relationship into much more than a charade. Yet both fear that every passing day brings them closer to being torn apart. So yeah, since I, I have a feeling it's going to be a heartbreaking ending, you guys. It's either going to have a relatively happy ending and things go well, or someone's going to die. It takes place in World War II. There's a good chance one of these, yeah, Nico or Nino, one of them's died, I bet. <laughs> Next up, Lore by Alexandra Bracken. And yeah, that's a cool cover, you guys, with like Medusa. I really, uh, I just really like the cover more than anything. But yeah, uh, I've heard this. It's kind of like, like Greek mythology meets the Hunger Games, if you will. Um, so yeah, every seven years, the Agon begins. As punishment for a past rebellion, nine Greek gods are forced to walk the earth as mortals. They are hunted by the descendants of ancient bloodlines, all eager to kill a god and seize their divine power and immortality. Long ago, Lord Perseus fled that brutal world, turning her back on the hunt's promises of eternal glory, after her family was murdered by a rival line. For years, she's pushed away any thought of revenge against the man, now a god, responsible for their deaths. Yet, as the next hunt dawns over New York City, two participants seek her out. Castor, a childhood friend, Lord believed to be dead, and Athena, one of the last of the original gods, now gravely wounded. The goddess offers Lore an alliance against our mutual enemy and a way to leave the, the Agon behind forever. And Lore's decision to rejoin the hunt, binding her fate to Athena's, will come at a deadly cost, and it may not be enough to stop the rise of a new god with the power to bring humanity to its knees. So yeah, this sounds really cool, you guys. I'm still not quite sure, is this taking place in like a modern-day setting? 
uh, what's going on there? Is it more of a fantasy setting? I'm still not quite sure. I guess I'll find out as I read this, but either way, it sounds really cool. Next up, The Awakening by Nora Roberts, and this is apparently book one in a series of The Dragonheart's Legacy. Ooh. I've never read a Nora Roberts book before. I know she's really popular. I've never read one of her books before, but there was something about this that I was like, this sounds kind of cool. I'm going to try this out. Um, so yeah, uh, Bryn Kelly works at a job she hates while trying to pay off her student loan, pinching pennies and fighting off anxiety attacks. She's prone to those along with, she's prone, she's prone to those along with headaches and strange dreams, like the one she just had in which she encountered a dragon. But as vivid as the dream was, she knows that the bedtime stories of magical places that her father told her about long ago, before he disappeared, were just that, stories. Only later, she's noticed a silver-haired man who seems to follow her everywhere, yet always eludes her when she tries to catch him. She thinks she hears his voice in her head. Come home, Breen Siobhan. It's time you come home. Then a sudden shock interrupts her everyday worries. While dutifully house-sitting for her cold, critical mother, she finds papers that had been previously locked away, records of an investment account worth nearly $4 million, an account that is in her name, a fortune that her long-lost father has been wiring to her for years, hidden from her by her mother. Good lord, this plot synopsis just keeps on going. It goes back here, too. It's a discovery that would turn anyone's life upside down. But for Bryn, it will change things in unimaginable ways because after she takes her rightful ownership of the money and flies to Ireland in hopes of finding her father, she will follow a dog into the forest in Galway and enter a place where fairies and elves and mermaids dwell, where a man named Keegan will train her to fight, where she will embrace powers she never knew she had, and where a newfound courage will lead her toward her destiny. Yeah, this just sounded really cool. I like kind of this mashup, you know, fantasy and modern. It sounds really cool. Uh, I'm willing to kind of give this a chance and see how I like it. And yeah, hopefully I'll like it enough and I'll continue with the trilogy. And last up, The Wife Upstairs by Rachel Hawkins. This is a book that I have read and reviewed and I really, really did enjoy this. And this is essentially like a modern day retelling, reimagining of Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Um, not only kind of that, but kind of this mashup too with Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, I felt like. Um, so yeah, just to kind of give you a quick synopsis here. Uh, meet Jane, newly arrived to Birmingham, Alabama. Alabama. Jane is a broke dog walker in Thornfield Estates, a gated community full of McMansions, shiny SUVs, and bored housewives. The kind of place where no one will notice if Jane lifts uh, jewelry off the side tables and off of her well-heeled clients where no one will think to ask if Jane is even her real name. Meet Eddie, recently widowed. He has become he has become Thornfield Estates', Estates most mysterious resident. Ever since his wife, B drowned in a boating accident with her best friend, their bodies lost to the deep. Jane can't help but see an opportunity in Eddie. Not only is he rich, brooding, and handsome, but he could also offer her the kind of protection she craves. Yet, as the two fall for each other, Jane is haunted by the legend of B, an ambitious beauty and successful entrepreneur, with a rags-to-riches origin story. How can she, playing Jane, ever measure up? And can Jane can Jane win Eddie's heart before her past or his catches up with her? Um, like I said, I really like this. I, I thought this was a pretty good uh, like retelling, reimagining, uh, setting Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte in a modern day setting. It worked for me. It was pretty great. I loved it. I love some, you know, kind of seeing some of those little things from Jane Eyre, kind of sprinkled in their interesting, unique ways. So yeah, if you like all things Jane Eyre, you might really like this. So you guys, that is it for my book haul in the comments below. Have you guys read any of these books? Do you plan on reading any of these? And which one of these should I perhaps get to sooner rather than later? Just let me know. So that's it for this video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you like this video, you may like these other videos. Bye guys.